Well, hey there, and welcome to episode number 516 of Six Pixels of Separation, the Miram podcast. My name is Mitch Joel. It's Sunday, May the 29th, 2016. Let's get on with the show. So who are you and what do you do? My name is Michael Schrag. I'm a research fellow at the MIT Initiative on the Digital Economy, and I do a lot of work on innovation, innovation culture, human capital, and why people do what they do and don't do what they're supposed to do. I'm such a business and marketing nerd, and I'll tell you why, Michael. I get invited by... Uh, to come and speak at Columbia School of Business, to come and speak the Bright Conference, which I had been following and just sort of worked out. And I came and I had spoken and you came over to me at lunch and I, I never knew the, what you looked like. I just knew your name. And so as I'm talking to you, I found myself uh, fumbling like, oh, this is Michael Schrag. What am I doing? <laughs> So that was my marketing nerd moment of of the week very recently. And then I was very sort of sheepishly saying, would you consider being on my podcast? So I'm so happy you're here. (laughs) Oh, you know, a little more snow in here and we could ski. Um, (laughs) Look, I thought that what you did was terrific. I thought it was a very interesting and weird group of people. (laughs) I I enjoyed it, but, but I couldn't tell the students from the practitioners, from the entrepreneurs to the solo practitioners. It was, an, it was a very unusual group, but I, li- I, I liked it very much and in no small part because the kind of speakers they quote unquote curated was, was you know, kind of off in a way. And I found that offness appealing. So I, I, I enjoyed it. I enjoyed it. I thought you did terrific. I really liked what you had to say. Well, I hope we're going to talk about it. That's high praise. What did you find? What do you mean by off in terms of the selection, the diversity of it? What was? There was no narrative arc. Hmm. There was no theme or cohesiveness. It was, it was everything from kind and being nice kind as in the company as well as the the attribute and affect to ESPN and Shakespeare to what is a brand by if you'll forgive me people who've been around since the the people they were joking about their textbooks and their MBA programs at Columbia so you really had a very we could say novel uh, let's use the politically correct word eccentric collection of old timers and and um, um, disruptor folks. So I think your sentiment on that lineup is actually indicative of one of the areas I'm super curious about. Because of the field that you're in and the work that you do, one word that's often used to describe you, which I think is endearing and is something that probably attracts me to your content and your thinking, is the fact that people say you're super provocative, that you really do say what's on your mind and you bring that forward. Um, one, I'm curious if you agree with that. Two, where does that come from? Yeah, well, you know, I, I will say, and I mean this quite seriously, there's a very, apparently, there's a very thin line between being provocative and insulting. Being a jerk, uh, yeah. <laughs> s- secondly, uh, you know, I will never forget being introduced on a panel as quite passive aggressively as a contrarian which, of course, pretty much undercut everything I was about to say. Uh, um, and the third is, you know, light bulb jokes, right? Of course. Yeah. Well, one of my friends made up a light bulb joke about me, Rob. said, how many Michael Schrags does it take to screw in a light bulb? You're asking the wrong it. question. You know, and that was, you know, the punchline for that. Um, I don't think I am provocative I don't think I am contrarian. I think I am somebody who takes the fundamentals very, very seriously. And I think the fundamentals are so important in an era of technological disruption, globalization, diversity of culture and individuals, that we need to revisit those fundamentals and see what aspects of the fundamentals hold fast and which ones have maybe decayed around the edges, or maybe 
the fundamental isn't quite the way we thought it was two or three years ago. So what people, for understandable reasons, choose to interpret as skepticism or cynicism or provocation, I view it as this is so important, I want to make sure that we are all on the same page or all have the same perception around what about the fundamentals matter. So this is an area where I get into a ton of trouble for because in the marketing world and especially my sort of edge of marketing, which is obviously innovation technology based, transformation based, I'm always the person who is railing against my peers who say things like the four P's are dead. And I'm like, how, how, how can you say that? Like it's marketing, right? Product, price, promotion, place. Well, you have digital. So that's the promotion part of it. It might even be a product part of it, but it still fits somewhere within those established buckets. I don't feel the need to add another to make it a 5P. I don't, like whenever I see new things, I still feel like they can somehow align maybe one, maybe multiple buckets. The other sentiment I get in my world, and I'm sure you see this in yours because you know, you're sort of, your your prism is, is usually driven by this sort of in, innovation as well and technology did, side. Did, is, did, did you say prism or prison? <laughs> it's both, it's both, yeah, it's both. Um, but people say to me, listen, you know, Mitch, um, what worked today won't may not work tomorrow or work last week won't work this week and that's why you have to be on the edge and a lot of times when people say that i'm always like it's in their vested interest to say that because then they get hired as the consultant or the speaker but that's not fundamentally true i mean the role of marketing beyond the four p's in the promotional aspect is to it's a it's a form of information that we're trying to inform a public a group of people that this product and service exists how it helps them how it benefits them et cetera, et cetera. and I always go back to that thought that you just said about the basics and I find that people are very quick to want to kill them because it's to it only has a financial benefit to them. Well, you uh, what you're saying is insightful and profound, insightful in both meanings of the word, insightful with an S and insightful with a C and and I want to I want to unpack it. Okay. Um my background, my background, technical background is computer science and economics, and my interest in economics shifted from the classic normative economics, i.e. how people are supposed to behave, which of course they never do, to behavioral economics, you know, the Dan Ariely, Richard Thaler, Daniel Kahneman stuff. Um, and, and, you know, the classic and, and what was discussed in the wonderful book Nudge as choice architectures. What you are identifying is the sunk cost, you know, the four P's. That's, that's the default. We go to what we're familiar with. And we have, on the other hand, the people who have an incentive to say, no, 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 no. The, the, the fundamentals, the basics, they're all irrelevant now. You know, blow it all up. Blow it all up. You know, and, and that's a horrible distribution to have. One is defaulting into what we know, and the other is everything you know is irrelevant and obsolete. And, 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 and at this stage, somebody's supposed to say, well, there's a happy medium. And I'm here to say no, and maybe this is provocative. There's no happy medium. You know, I, I think that, let's take your example of the four Ps. I accept the four Ps are a wonderful framework. I don't accept that it is a smart thing for organizations to default to the four P's mm. in how they plan a marketing campaign or rethink the fundamentals that I picked that word deliberately of their brand. Here's why. We talk about price. What does price mean in a freemium market? What does price mean when oftentimes we get more value from the information associated with the interaction than the consummation of the transaction itself. Take that, put it off to the side. Okay. Product. What does product mean when the user experience is really understood and appreciated most in the context of a service component? I, I literally wrote a piece for Fast Company over a decade ago, geez, 15 years ago, where I joke about provises and surducts, product-flavored services and service-flavored products. Why did I do this? 
Because literally in the span of 48 hours, I had one client, it was a product company, and the product company was saying, oh my gosh, all of our products are degenerating and decaying into commodities. We need to wrap services around that. How do we do that? How does a product company understand and design in and build in and bake in a service sensibility? And the flip side was I was at a service company that was saying, our assets go home every night. We need products. We need something more tangible than, than the services we provide. And so literally in, in, in the span of two days, I was dealing with 180 degree opposite perspectives on this. And, and now let's leap to the digital. Digital is like the universal solvent between product and service and brand and direct. And it forces us to think about what values, not just value, economic value, but values we stand for and wish to project as individuals and organizations. And that's why I think the fundamentals are so important. So yes, I accept the importance of the four Ps, but no, I think it's a mistake to allow a 2015, de the year 2015 definition of the four Ps to determine how you interpolate and optimize those four Ps for a product, service, user experience that you plan on offering in 2020. I, I don't think it's going to work. I don't think it's going to work. Well, so I, I look at it a little bit like, and maybe it's, it's, it's the sort of non-academic side of me where I don't see them as being these fixed rigid boxes where everything has to go in and it can't be in another box. I look at it more like a construct of can you, can you complete a marketing task without looking at things like, you know, without looking at those areas, I guess. I'd look at them more as areas instead of boxes. So if you were to, if you were to say something like, well, let's talk about freemium in a pricing model, I would say that actually freemium, the component of freemium is the promotion part that draws you in to ha! then move towards ha! the pricing structure. Ha! Right? You, God, I, I feel like you've walked into a trap that I didn't realize I had set up. I've, I've, I'm, I'm, you walk into a CPG organization and you, you make that argument and then step back because there's going to be blood on the wall. Right. Yeah, no, I'm, I'm, not saying, I'm, I'm not saying that people love what I say. I'm just saying that there's right. a strategy there. <laughs> but this, I, and I completely agree, but that strategy is going to set the, the promotion people and the brand people and the sales people in, in a fight. You've, right. you've, you've now taken something from a pricing strategy into a promotion strategy. And now we're dealing with the one thing that's completely unpredictable with all due respect to my, you know, acquaintances like Laszlo Bach and the predictive analytics crowd. I and mean, people, people, who, you tell me, who should own? You work with more organizations than I do. Who should own freemium? in the organization yeah. it's like the joke i would say is you're right and as as they would be throwing the tomatoes at me in the office right. I'd, I'd probably walk out and say well i guess none of these folks are going to work in the music industry <laughs> exactly exactly <laughs> I'm, I'm really also fascinated with where in 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 your career did you latch on to this this area of innovation and communication because it's easy when you're in a world. It's easy. It's easy when you're in the world of IT and economics to stay in that tract and still really evolve it and expand it. And it's one thing even to go from economics to behavioral economics, which I really do believe, from an area of academic and study, is is a big. It's a big leap. It's a whole other different world. So where where in your in your career you're like this innovation thing is sort of it's scratching at me. That's. You know, I'm sorry to say that's a that's an easy question to answer. I I and you know I don't want to get either mawkish or maudlin. I grew up in in Chicago's Hyde Park. Uh, I grew up in this will come as a huge shock to you, in an academic family, and and uh, although I, I was always a little more interested in markets than than my family was, although. Just a quick digression. My brother ended up being at Facebook when it went public. So, you know, apparently the interest in markets was was sibling as well as individual. I'd say who's uh, laughing now, but you know, you're, uh, you're nothing. Um, you're nothing to cry about. So. Let's put it this way: my brother can afford to laugh. You know, <laughs> right. so. In fact, he can buy people to laugh for him. That's, <laughs> that's how well he's doing. Um, yeah, great guy. 
How does um, he sleep at night on a pile of uh, money, right? <laughs> I will use that. Thank you very, thank you very much. Um, I, there's a good Bitcoin joke in there somewhere. We'll yeah. find it by the end of the, the conversation. Um, I was always interested in new value, not just new, not just novelty, but new value. How do people get value from new things? How do people perceive val value was my Schwerpunkt mm -hmm. or center of gravity here? So, you know, let's do the Venn diagram thing. There's new, there's interesting, and then there's value. And if you're a scientist, you know, you're very, very interesting in new stuff for the sake of being new, okay? But I, I was, I, I don't know, I was always interested in how people got value from stuff. And, and just, to, just to make it out that I'm not a total geek on this, I was just as interested in this in the artistic and aesthetic sense as in the science and engineering sense. You know, how do people get value? And, and of course, I remember the wonderful, you know, Oscar Wilde line, you know, is that cynics know the price of everything and the value of nothing. Mm -hmm. And this was the problem with the economics I was taught in school because, because it's price. It's price theory. Now, don't want to get too technical, but, but you know, one of the real, quote, unquote, revolutions that occurred, and it was in no small part from the University of Chicago area was the notion of utiles and subjective expected utility. And so the notion of utility versus price, uh, this was how my mind worked. I was interested in, but, but notice the continuity with how this conversation began. What is the appropriate fundamental organizing principle? In classical microeconomics, it's price and exchange. I, I was more interested in value and exchange of value, not price is the point where value is exchanged, but but why, how do, do exchanges and collaboration create new value? So that was it. Utiles. So I was I was really value was my organizing principle, not price, and that's why I didn't just drift, but but ran shrieking away from the classical microeconomics and economics that I was taught. Do you feel that this idea of, of value over price is actually coming to fruition at the macro scale? And what I mean by that is I'm friends with Doug Rushkoff and his new book, uh, Throwing Rocks to Google Bus. He talks a go. lot about sure. economics and the economy, the inequity, the 1%, digital currencies, um, you know, actually having currency that has no link to government. government. Um, yeah. And then there's another sort of, I don't want to call them the sort of hippies of the digital era or the sort oh, of burning man of that, but there is this group that believes that there needs to be a new form of currency that isn't driven by that price, but rather the value. What, what value does this, does this work add to our society versus how much do we pay for it? And can we, can we figure out new areas of compensation? And it sounds a bit sort of like hurly gurly, but I always laugh and say, yeah, it, or Star Trek, you know, it's like, you just, you know, Star Trek really was a place where people did the work that was important to them. And they, you know, I guess it's communism and it's perfection to a certain degree. Right. Do, you, do you look at this stuff that you're doing and because of the arc of your career and what you've seen and what you've gone through, that there is this sort of little hole of light that might expand to get us to a place where we can move into a truly value-based economy and not look at crazy valuations and go, well, how's that possible? Because no one's ever going to buy that? Well, I think, let's step back. I think there are always going to be crazy valuations because people are people. And, you know, right. it's the McKay book, The Extraordinarily Popular Delusions and the Madness of Crowds. Uh, uh, there, there's, there's going to be a hype cycle independent of whether there are IPOs or not because people are people. Um, you know, and, and Doug Rushkoff, who I, I know casually, I think would be amused that you're sort of putting him in the Hakean camp, you know, as opposed to a, a shall we say, left of center camp. Right. Um, I, I want to be careful. I'm, 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 I never liked macroeconomics. You know, I, I was not a Keynesian kind of a guy. I'm, I'm, I, but I, I want to drill down on what, what you're saying on the value aspect. I think that one of the truly, truly nifty things, and not nifty, nifty short shrifts it, one of the great things is 
greater diversity of technology and innovation and the value that that diversity of technology can enable and the choices that that diversity and value of technology can enable give people more flexibility, more resilience, more options about how they wish to create value and consume value and exchange value. It is the other E word. It is all about empowerment. I like empowerment. And my fear, I'm not worried about the 1%. I'm not worried about the upper decile or the quintile. I'm worried about the median. I'm worried about how people at the median and below the median, economically and in other dimensions, how do they get to reap the benefits in their own minds and in their own eyes of this explosion of choice? Do you think they I mean, can, though, pragmatically? Yes. Okay. Do, do I think they can? Yeah, I, I'm an optimist in that way. Yeah. I, 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 I'm a pessimist in the sense of I believe that we are entering a time where the top 5 or 10% people who are capable of getting the most value out of innovation are going to get the most value out of innovation. So these, They're going to capitalize this, on it. Interesting choice of words, eh? <laughs> uh, uh, um, that's correct. That's correct. You know, if everybody's car looks alike, you know, it's, it doesn't make much of a difference what kind of a driver you are. But, but once you start having autonomous cars or semi-autonomous cars, you know, the, the, the variance, the beta, is going to get much, much higher. I'm of the view, and, and yes, this does respect, reflect perhaps my upper middle class white male bias, it, that I don't really care how Bill Gates and, and Larry and Sergey, or for that matter, my brother, are in spending their money and enjoying themselves so long as people aren't impoverished or feel like they don't have certain kinds of opportunities. And... and but, but, are, not, but aren't they? Society kind of guy. But aren't they? And isn't there a greater digital divide? And don't we? Aren't we actually seeing the problems of that? And the fact that you know, it was simple, simplistic, is how many people Facebook employs versus the market capitalization and revenue. Like, there's just not enough jobs for that. We go autonomous. It's easy to say, yeah, cars and taxis is easy. It's infrastructure. Suddenly, it, it changes. That middle that you're talking about erodes in a How lot. ironic. How ironic. Growing up in the 50s, which I didn't, but I read about it, you know, what did Marx and Adam Smith both, both talk about in the workplace? All together now. Alienation. Right. They talked about alienation. And, you know, you worked on the assembly line, blah, 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 blah. Now people don't have to work and it's horrible because nobody has a job. I don't, and, and by the way, back to Keynes. Keynes, back in the 30s, forecast a time where, where the biggest challenge most people would have, most people would have, would be how do they spend their leisure time. So I, 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 I'm, I am not here, unlike you, I am not here to predict the future. I can't, I can't predict the future. I want to revisit the fundamentals. I want people to come out of quote-unquote school or educational programs and training programs with the ability to create value that is economically recognized and appreciated in a market. And they're in a position to exchange or, or supported by the state. And they're in a position to exchanging so they have meaning and value in their lives for themselves as individuals and for their partners who they choose to be with. And that's good enough for me. I want people to say that they have, and I, I don't care where they are in the socioeconomic spectrum, I want people to say, to grow up in a society where they feel that when something crosses their mind or appeals to their heart or their sense of self, they're in a position to pursue that opportunity in a meaningful way. Does that mean they get to make a living at it? Absolutely not. Just in the same way that every garage band musician doesn't get to, you know, play Madison Square Garden or TD Garden or whatever it is. That's my quote unquote societal vision. That's, that's really all I aspire to in that regard. What's the difference between now and the future and 10, 20 years ago in the past? I think Bentamite. More people are going to have more opportunities to pursue what they're interested in, in a cost-effective, reasonable, 
and emotionally meaningful way. That, I think, is the gift and virtue of the technological revolutions, plural, of which we are a part and which we contribute. Yeah, we're super aligned. It's funny when people say to me, are you an optimist? I say I'm more opportunistic than I am an optimist. I think that that's a ability, wonderful line. Yeah, because I really do. I think that, and again, it's, it's not to be contrary to what I was saying. I was curious about the, the level, the alignment of thinking for you and where you were at. But in my brain, when people ask me like, hey, and I get this all the time, I'm sure you do too, where it's like, you know, uh, it, it could be a young person, where do I want to go with my career? It could be somebody who's uh, achieved a, a lot of success and is being offered something else. Should I make the move? How do I deal with it? It could be, in fact, and interestingly enough, the most common thing I'm dealing with now is ageism, where I have people who are in their later 40s to exactly. mid 50s who are coming to me and saying, what can I do? How do I do this? And my, my, my thing is it's easy to say to them to, to be optimistic, because it's emotional, but I say to them, try and be opportunistic. Like, look at the fact that if you go back in time, you just couldn't do this stuff. I tell people all the time, like when I was a when I started off as a music journalist, my ability to get that idea to a public was next to impossible. Handful of magazines, right. none of them wanted to speak to some teenage kid from Montreal. But the minute blogging became more accessible, which again I've been doing for a long, long time. Right. I, I jumped in because it was opportunistic of me to be able to now admit my the minute I hit that publish button, it's distributed to the world. What I do with that distribution is, is secondary almost. But the, the, look, again, I don't mean to sound like a suck up, but that's that's exactly right. And and I'm going to steal from you, albeit with attribution on the opportunistic versus optimistic. I, I completely agree with you. It's very, very hard to deal, now I'm going to be ageist in the other direction. It's very, very hard to deal with people who have a sense of entitlement and, and, and tell them, you really need to be looking at things as a portfolio of opportunities <laughs> rather than you're, because you've done X, you're entitled to get Y. You know, I, I really think that that's the attitudinal and organizational and cultural issue. I want to deal with your other aspect of ageism. I think the notion of what does it mean to how do you view opportunity when you're 55 and have been successful doing what you've been doing for the last 20 years and then you realize that all the economic underpinnings that, that led to your success have, had, have been knocked away. I mean, you're a 55-year-old newspaper or magazine journalist. What the F do you do? What the F do you do? Tons of opportunity, though. Job? What does it mean to have a job at the LA Times? Sure. What does it mean to have a job in an industry that is literally going bankrupt? But again, that's that's sort of what our mutual friend Seth Godin calls, you know, embrace the end of those gatekeepers. You know, I call it the I call it the allowance syndrome, right? Instead of going to daddy and asking him for allowance or mummy every week, now you can go get your own allowance. <laughs> do, do, uh, look, we are all in violent agreement. How do you now? Now we'll get to the hard, the hardcore compassion hard issue. What do you say to the fifty-five-year-old who says, "Well, that's easy for you to say. This is all I know. I, 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 I don't, I don't know if I have it in me to to educate myself in that way." Yeah, but nothing's stopping a dog from lying on the street and waiting for its life to end versus the dog that goes out during its day looking for things to sniff and eat and hunt and do whatever it's, dogs don't, do. Don't don't compare a fifty-five-year-old unemployed to a dog. to both the dogs <laughs> in the street, Mitch. You're going to yeah, run into I mean, trouble at uh, Miguel and Concordia. They're not even. Stuff. What I'm trying to say is they don't even have consciousness. So if they could, no, but my but but the other component to this, and I think it, it's actually driven very much by a lot of the thinking that you've done in terms of the the combination of innovation technology is, you know, I have a sort of platitude that I toss out when I speak and I tell people that we often forget that we've hit a, a, a dramatic inflection point in business and technology and the integration of the two, which happened really uh, in the early days and popularity of the iPad, which is this moment that I simplify saying technology has finally removed technology from technology. Right. The, the barrier for that the ageist crowd to move has typically been, I don't know these skills. And it used to be, I can't type to, I, you know, computers and programs and installations and this and that. And, you know, the, the running joke that everybody's kids are their IT department too. And they right. come over on the weekend, they fix the printer. All that is now gone because these devices don't have instruction manuals. They're completely intuitive. Right. They're connected access, blah, 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 blah. And 
I, what I mean by the, the dog analogy is simply that you're to say, you know, it, it's beyond me isn't a fact. It's a mindset. Whereas before saying it's beyond me was real. Like, I don't know if you ever had to instruct a, a parent or somebody else who's older how to use it. It was very frustrating if you weren't a teacher by nature. I, mean, I completely, <laughs> look, I completely agree with you. And, you know, it's sort of funny because what you're saying gives me a sense of nostalgia because back when I was a newspaper reporter, back, you know, gatekeeper, etc., one of the stories I did that got an enormous response was about documentation for technical stuff. <laughs> you know, when I have great stories like that too, because I was a writer back then as well, but go, I exactly. like this. <laughs> people, people made a very nice living doing technical documentation until, you know, really good user experience. It's not, the, it's, the, the, the purpose is not to produce a better manual. It's to get rid of the manual. Right. It's, it's to get rid of those people. Amazing. Yeah, the story that I tell is in the early, early 90s, I had a, a sort of independent, free ad driven publication. And I had a cover story on this new thing called the net that was becoming commercialized. And the innovation at the time that we were breaking through is the idea of hyperlinks. Right. <laughs> you could click on a link and go to another page because back then I, you obviously had to go in the browser and type that. And, and a million stories like that where you s sort of see how this technology remo has removed itself from technology. The other part of your work, Michael, that I'm so but, fast. But, but, I just want to, forgive me, I just want to hit, hit this one thing that you said. And, and again, violent agreement. And this is, you've, I, you've put your finger or, you know, or whatever particular organ we want to talk about on the It's the mindset. It's the mindset. You're right. It's not the technology. And what does it mean to be in the influencing or changing people's mindset business? But that's the business How, you and I are fundamentally in, right? We are. But, it's a, but you know what? It's a hard business because you and I are, uh, uh, agree w talking to that 50-year-old who, who, who's perhaps a contemporary or not, and, and they don't buy what we're saying. They don't buy it. I'm in the middle of it right now. I'm I'm at the final stages of a new presentation, which I typically don't do. I sort of tweak slides and add things in and then builds to like almost a full set like a stand-up comedian would. But mm -hmm. I'm actually started from scratch with one that the working title is virtually there. And it's about virtual reality and augmented reality for brands and business. And it, it feels exactly like that moment where even as I say it, I'm like people roll their eyes and go parlor tricks and I'm not going to wear goggles. And all I do when I hear that is I replay in my mind all of those stories. Why would I need a computer in my house? Why would I need a modem? Why why would I need a phone? Why would I need? Right. I can't type on glass. Why would I need? A, yeah, I, and but but when you uh, when you look at that perspective of the the, the role you and I have, I, I feel like it's not to be provocative. It's to provide early stages and plant seeds of what. Again, for me in the in the case of augmented reality, virtual reality is the next platform. It's it's clear. It's it's going to take us a while to get there. There's technical all those challenges we always have. But that role, I still think, is vitally important, especially as it applies to business leaders. Because I think now more than ever, they've sort of, I think they've learned from the mistakes. Like they can't sit on the sidelines like they did with the internet. They can't sit on the sidelines like they sort of still are with mobile. I don't think, that, I mean, I really hope it's not going to repeat itself on that platform. Oh, it's, it's, it's going, going to. to. <laughs> it's going to, it's which going is to good. Itself. High but, five, right, you to, and I. <laughs> just to build on one thing, I, I'm going to offer y you and the people who, who are, who've made it this far, you know, a, a, a $100,000 piece of advice. You know, what you are describing and what you're dealing with is, is the phrase, you know, people in, in organizations and individuals call it change. How do we deal with change? How do we embrace change, change management? Here's the problem with the word change. The problem with the word change is that it's neutral. There's good change, there's bad change. You know, there's change that enhances things, there's change that destroys and undermines things. I've gone into organizations and have said, do a global search and replace. Wherever you have the word change, substitute the word improvement. Don't ask people to change, ask people to improve. I Don't ask that. the organization to embrace change, ask the organization to embrace improvement. And that puts the burden on you to define, we're improving along what dimensions, in what ways. Because change can go both ways. Improvement there's an aspirational aspect to it that I think does, if it doesn't change a mind, pun intended, it influences. And it's funny too. Like, I think that's, I think, I think that, but I think that's hard. I think that's hard. I'm very sympathetic. Yeah. I mean, it's it, hard. 
people who are even telling me you know, they're change agents, they're agents of change in the company. Exactly. I say to them, there's a big difference between change and habits, and people don't recognize that. And so the 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 sort of coy joke I play is, you know, oh, you love change. Okay, this is what we're going to do for a week. I'm going to sneak into your house before you wake up and move your coffee machine every day to a different place of your house. Tell me how much you like change. Exactly. And it's like you know, exactly. you're going to by the day two, you're going to be breaking the coffee, you know, pot when you find it and cutting my throat with it. And my point is, is that it's exactly in line with that, that if you look at change as completely trying to get people out of the, the regular habits, it's going to create so much friction that it gets harder to do there. But if you look at brands that really have done change in the sense of improvement, it's iterative, it's optimization. And so I have seen companies where they come in and they go, yeah, we're going to change. No. Today, we're going to change one little thing. We're going to make the button on the site green instead of yellow, see which does better. And then we'll keep... And, that's not really changed to me. That's an iteration. That's an optimization. It's an improvement. And I'm, it boggles my mind when I sit down with organizations and they have this attitude of, you know, we, we need that transformation, which is another word for that. And I'm like, I don't think you have the constitution oh God, to do this at I, all. <laughs> you and I are in complete agreement that the best way to do quote unquote transformation is not to say everything you know is obsolete. You're all tabula rasa. It's, it's how do we do seductive, rapid iteration where people feel empowered that, you know, when you give that green or that red button, the reality is you get to choose. And I mean, this, was, choose. this is core to, you... yeah, this is core to everything you were doing in serious play. I mean, it really. Thank you. It really yes. The, so the, the other area that I, I want to talk about before we got to jump out of here is there's a lot of stuff that I'll read of yours. And I'll read it and I'll sort of like close the book and I have my notes and I have all my stuff because I like to sort of really capture things. And I go, yeah, yeah, no, it's it's okay. I get it. And I'll give you an example. Uh, customer acceptance um, as a part of the innovation process. Now, when I first read that, I went, no shit, of course. What I fail to sometimes acknowledge is that when you brought these theories forward, people were not doing this before. And that's typically when my mind gets blown. If, if you know what I mean, because I'll sometimes yeah. come to your work not as it's published, but several years later or something floats into my feed and I see something. And when I see things like that, you know, like even rapid prototyping model, no kidding, I'm a digital guy. The whole thing was, you know, quick wireframes, let's go, like, let's, it blows my mind almost that people weren't even considering that before. <laughs> yeah, but, but, but you see, this is where I have the advantage of an economics background, you know, and, and. The, the the diversity of organizations that I was dealing with, <clears throat> and this is going to this explanation is going to sound um, the the people on the left will interpret this as a Marxist interpretation. The people on the right will interpret it as a Hakean uh, uh, interpretation or or refraction, and and that is if if I, I grew up, I was in the last class in in university that actually used punch cards in computer science. You know, they shut down the machine. There, that so that that's my my technical demarker. For, I'm, I'm laughing because I'm not. I'm trying to think of like something funny to say, like oh, like last week, right? But like, it's, it's, it was a while ago. Oh, you're supposed to say don't bend, fold, spindle, or mutilate. I think is, is you were the, in class with your parents at the time. You're actually uh, very uh, young. It was, yes, it was it was the freshman weekend. Exactly. You know? But but being absolutely serious. For most organizations, if you're, in, if you're a 1985 automobile company or a 1990 automobile company or you're IBM, all of your infrastructure, all of your processes mitigate against rapid iteration. Right. You are about return on assets. Your assets aren't agile and flexible. They're rigid and robust, and and it doesn't make sense. It's it's the difference between doing you know waterfall. I'll, I'll tell you, a, a, and this was this is still remember extreme programming and agile. Hmm. In, in, I'm talking in the year 2000, and even in the internet era, I was still dealing with Fortune 100 company IT groups, and these are good people. They're smart people. I, I have no criticism of them as as smart people, but they're back to fundamentals. Their unit of analysis was what? Let's talk to our customer and client and do requirements. Let's gather requirements. Let's build to requirements. Let's prioritize the requirements. Requirements suck. 
as a unit of analysis. You know, because what happens whenever you do the demo, you've spent nine months developing a prototype based on what your client says they want, and then you do the demo, and what does the client say four out of five times? Well, yeah, I know that's what I've asked for, but now that I see it, I realize it's not what I want. You're so much better off getting the top 10 requirements, doing a rapid prototype, and using the prototype to elicit the requirements and interactions that people want. And then it's not requirements anymore. I've gone into organizations say, don't do requirements, do use cases. Do use cases. Now, you can't do a use case with a VAX. You can't do a use case with a, dare I say it, IBM 370. But those days are gone. Those days are gone. Now you've got the cloud of Amazon Web Services. You've got Azure. You've got literally, literally a global infrastructure that transforms the economics of prototyping. I don't even know why people talk in terms of requirements anymore. It should all be about user experience, user expectations, and use cases. You understand this because you were one of the first bloggers. You understood that, that blogging was as much about pop culture as it was about information transition, uh, transmission. Well, I also saw from the early days, right, like, I mean, my, my story goes back to the Atari 800 and having the first on matrix printer and the first modem and that sort of thirst to, to, to sort of see early days of connectivity while I'm definitely yeah. not a digital native, but as Dan, as Don Tapscott would say, I, I'm definitely bathed in bits, if you know what I mean. Like I'm yeah. looking at that framework yeah. as, wow. I'm I've actually... noticed, by the way, this incredible bias you have about quoting Canadians. Why don't you go the whole nine yards and start doing Innes and McLuhan? Are we gonna? Are we gonna? Are we gonna bring up your heritage? Uh, my my, I'm proud of my 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 bifurcated Canadian heritage. <laughs> right, exactly. You you've doubled down on it. I don't, yeah. Only because that you know we're so kind and smart, especially during this uh, in, insanely political climate in the u.s so we, we sort of run with that i want to i'm also insanely curious. was the exact right word <laughs> exactly. i'm being super polite because i'm canadian uh innovation okay so this is something again you've established and brought forward and everybody really jumped on good ideas one thing that's great innovation is, is good ideas that consumers will pay a premium to adopt and use and that was the that was really a, a foundational sort of shift in how people thought about innovation, where innovation resides in the organization, how it evolves and what happens. Now, when I think of that, you know, I think as a marketing person, my brain naturally and intuitively is going to default to who's done that exceptionally well. My obvious answer, and I think it's an obvious default for everybody, is to say Apple. Apple has got to be the best example of that. When I say that, it also somewhat bothers me. And I'm wondering how you feel. Like, one is, would you agree that Apple is one of the best examples of a company at scale that's adopted it? And does it also, in a certain way, make you feel like, oh, it's such a. I always find Apple's the toughest company to use as an example because it's such an anomaly. Maybe every company's an anomaly, though. Well, I'm not uncomfortable. I, uh... Apple doesn't make me, un I want to come back to, to a, a prefatory comment that you make. Sure. I'm completely, quote unquote, comfortable putting a Netflix in that category. I'm completely comfortable putting an Amazon. But why in Netflix? That Netflix isn't a premium. Netflix is the opposite of premium. I'm spending eight bucks a month to pay for an entire access to an entire library versus I used to spend 60 bucks a month on three DVDs. Oh my God. I, forgive me. What's your unit of analysis? Here you are, you get- Okay, we're going back to value, not price. <laughs> I, fell in, value. I fell in the trap. Oh my God, your recommendation. <laughs> Amazon turned you in, uh, Netflix turned you into a, into a binge viewer in a way that those CD- Girl, I'm embarrassed. Things, <laughs> my God, Netflix has transformed. I joke, I joke that you know, the only way I can get my wife to stroke me in bed is if I dress up like an iPad. You know? <laughs> That's- Fair enough. Yeah. I, I just, I, I, what, and it's funny because this is what I was going to ask you about. I don't think of you as a marketing guy. I really don't think of you as a marketing guy. Tell me what I should be. I'll, I'll lie down on the therapist couch right I, now. I'm tell not, me. Not, yeah, lie down. I, well, I'm not going to tell you what you should be. I, I, I think that, that marketing, this, ironically or appropriately, this goes right back to the very beginning of the conversation. I think marketing is a very... Ted Levitt, Marketing Myopia, 1960s. I think that's a 60s concept. I mean, it's literally 50 years ago. I don't, I don't think you're about marketing. I, I think you're about, one of the reasons why we're 
kindred spirits or kindred intellects is you're really fascinated by how do people get value from stuff? Yeah, markets for sure. Absolutely. Yeah. That, that's the thing. Value from markets. And, and, and we talk about user, ex look, in the old days, it was what features and functions. You know, you went down a checklist of features and functions. That's, that's gone now because it's the user. Ex it, does anybody think in terms of Uber in terms of, talk about premiums, features and functions? I don't know. No, it's, it's the user experience there. What kind of experiences and what kind of expectations are associated with that? So is sorry, I'm sorry to interrupt, but are you also? It, it's funny because you're right, and I'm I'm going to retract that thought because actually, what I'm thinking now is almost every business that is is scaling at the way all of us are sort of ooing and eyeing about are literally driven by that thought that the that it's the paying of the premium to adopt. Is that what you're saying? Well, you know, the, the issue is. When I say paying a premium, here's the problem with the phrase paying a premium. The, the, somebody who's grown up in the era that we grew up in, paying a premium means, we'll, we'll, we'll stick with the alliteration here, paying a premium means price. But there's a premium to be associated with every time I shop and buy something, I go to Amazon or check on Amazon. There's a premium in every time I do a search, I do a Google. There's a premium in every time I really rely on a device, it's through Apple. Mm -hmm. There's a premium associated with any time I really consume video, because as much as I like Amazon, I don't like Amazon Prime, so I'm doing Netflix. There's the premium associated with the time we spend, the expectations of the experience, the stickiness there, the information that that institution or organization that company acquires from us because that's where we're not just spending our time and thought but investing our time and thought you know one of the key points to, forgive me for connecting this to some of my own work but the point that i'm trying to make is once you buy into the notion that we're in an iterative world we're not just doing transactions it's an investment mm -hmm. it's an investment netflix knows my god Netflix is developing original programming based on the data drawn from its binge viewers. It casts based on that. It, it, it samples storylines based on that. And not in some sort of rigid automaton sort of way, but in a, in a vibrant kind of way about we really do have insights into people who want to commit, and I'm picking this phrase deliberately, 20 hours of their lives sometimes consecutively <laughs> to watch something you know and experience something and with someone not just by themselves that's one of the hard my gosh you how does how does netflix get to the next 10 billion it comes up with recommendation engines for couples and families not just for individuals oh my god the opportunities there are enormous they're enormous. that's what i mean by premium you know so so Amazon Prime is an extraordinarily profitable thing for the company to do. It creates stickiness. What Amazon wants to have happen is that if they raise the price of Prime, the price, and picking that P word, the, the price of Prime by another $10 a year, they want the reaction from 90% of the people who subscribe to Prime is no big deal. It's more than worth it to me. Yeah, and okay. the other, the, I mean, and there's so many models within that. And again, exactly. kind, of, kind of you not to say that I'm a marketing guy, but the other side is the value of the customer as a as a as a media unit is at a is at like I don't think I don't think mass retailers like Walmart really fundamentally understand that. I'm not trying to belittle them or the people who work there, the economists that are there. I don't think they really understand that when they have a customer, the media value of them is next to zero. But when you're on Amazon, the value of that customer from a media unit is like multiples and multiples and multiples and it makes the gap for them to 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 compete with them harder because i really do believe that when amazon moves this media business which is already a billion dollar business that'll scale a lot more rapidly in the coming years but when they move that they can actually sell you things for less than cost because they're making it up dramatically that's on the other side and that's that's like a staggering let, let me let me put a snap in the tail of what you're saying it's not that they sell stuff for less than cost their ability to alter their their business model to cross subsidize right. in ultimately profitable ways they can do that with agility and flexibility in a way that walmart literally can't i agree with you completely on walmart in fact let me tell you a story on myself in that regard 
over a decade ago, I was on a panel at MIT, and this lovely woman, Linda Dillman, who was then the CIO, Chief Information Officer of Walmart, was on the panel. And, you know, we were talking before we were going on stage, and I was, you know, saying effusive in my praise of Walmart, saying, you guys understand technology, you do supply chain better than anybody else. And when you go the Tesco and loyalty, the Tesco route and the Kroger route and the loyalty route for customer analytics, you guys are going to own retail. You're going to own retail. And Linda Dillman looks at me like I am not the sharpest knife in the drawer. And she looks at me like I'm a stupid person and basically says, literally, Michael, we're, we don't discriminate. We're everyday low pricing for everyone. It's not that Walmart couldn't do the kind of analytics that Amazon does, but Walmart's business model is predicated on we're a big buyer, we run supply chain efficiently so that we can provide low prices, the same low prices to everyone. Walmart's not going to have a loyalty program. And if it does have a loyalty program, it's going to represent a cultural revolution that Sam Walton, the founder of the company, never wanted to have. Violently disagreed with. Absolutely. He did not, for sure. Exactly. He was all about lowest price, not not signing up. And, 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 and just to connect this to you, just so I can suck up to you one more time before, before, before we end here, this is a mindset issue because it's not as if the people in Walmart aren't smart. They are smart. My God, I'm from Chicago. I mean... The people at Sears used to make fun of Walmart as a bunch of hicks. Who's laughing now? You know? Michael, These are uh, smart people. It's a mindset issue. It's a mindset issue. And it's a people. I, I, I love people. Some of my best friends are people. <laughs> but people are the, it's, it's who is prepared not just to change their mind, but to change their behavior, to take advantage of these opportunities. That's the big issue. That's the big issue. I have so many other things I want to go through with you, so I'm hoping this was somewhat enjoyable for you, and you'll agree to come back at one point in the future. But before we go, there is one area that we didn't touch on, we didn't, t and I just got to know your opinions before we go. Sure. You work very closely with the U.S. government on issues of national security and systems information and technology, which is a complete rabbit hole that I'm fascinated in. I think we could go down and spend hours there. But the, the sort of pressing one that's very public now that I'm most curious about is obviously this whole Apple FBI yeah. component of it. Because of your background, your history, where you are, where you sit, what are your thoughts on this whole thing? Well, um, I, I want to answer this question with a disclaimer, which is, yes, I do spend a non-trivial amount of time on these kinds of issues, but I do not have a clearance. I am not privy to, to FISA, you know, the Foreign Intelligence uh, Surveillance Court uh, rulings. I, uh, you know, I, I, I don't have classified knowledge. I do talk with people in those spheres. And uh, you know the phrase, hard cases make bad law. Mm -hmm. The Apple FBI situation is the perfect example of a very, very hard case that's going to lead to a bad outcome. It doesn't matter whether the outcome favors Apple. It doesn't matter if the outcome favors the FBI. It's going to be a bad outcome. Why? Because America, this is not an American issue. Mm -hmm. This is a global issue. Right. If we do rule of law in America, what does Apple, what does Google, what does Facebook, what do, what, what, what do, does LinkedIn, what does Amazon do when the Chinese and the Russians and the Indians and the Brazilians want the same access, want the same backdoor. The issue what China has been pushing is called cyber sovereignty, you know, which is you should adhere to the rule of law, however arbitrary and capricious it may be, however dictatorial or authoritarian or totalitarian it may be in the company, countries in which you operate. So whatever happens in America, one way or the other, will be seized upon by the rest of the world. These are global issues, and, and there is no way, there, 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 there's no way out of it. There, 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 I'm sorry to end on such a downer note. No, it's important there's that no people hear happy, this. There's no happy way that, that privacy is always going to be compromised for national security, and the flip side is national security is, is going to always be threatened because the, by the tension between people who would seek to abuse technical safeguards to 
protect their ability to inflict harm and damage on innocents. There, nobody is going to win. This is going to be one of those circumstances where, where it all ends in tears. And it's, it's about pain management rather than opportunity management. Hmm. I want to list off some of probably all your books, Serious Play, Shared Minds, uh, Innovators, Hypothesis, uh, Who Do Your... Who do you want your customers to become? There are others. Amazing work, amazing thought leadership perspectives. I can't thank you enough for taking all the time you've been spent with me today. Like I said, hopefully you'll come back. I want you to tell people who are listening where they can best connect to your stuff online. Uh, you know, Google or Bing me. Uh, I'm, I'm always happy to communicate via LinkedIn as well. Uh, I'm reachable through MIT. And anybody who takes the time to, to listen to Mitch on this, I'm, 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 you're, you're part of that kindred spirit community, and, and I look forward to the interaction and engagement. And I just want to tell you again, I'll, I'll continue my narrative theme of being a sycophant. This was a terrific conversation, and now I'm going to have to take notes on what we talked about. I've got my little notepad here. Michael, I can't thank you enough. Thanks for your time. A real pleasure. Thank you, Mitch. Mm-hmm.